Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There's been um, a lot of talk today about GMs. So are we, are we ready to talk a bit more about GMs now? Get into a bit more detail? How many GMs here in the room? Show of hands. Oh, we've got quite a few, okay. This is the right audience then. And those who are not general managers, please bear with us because we're gonna have a conversation uh, about how we go about, about our business. What I'd like to say right at the beginning is, we are incredibly fortunate to be living in these exciting times. And I say that because our industry is at the very forefront of the increased appetite for travel and guests who are demanding experiences. You heard a lot about that this morning. There is also a lot of talk about value. A lot of people talk today about the value uh, that they would place on different services. And I'd like to throw a little bit of spotlight on what is the value that we put on our general managers. I've done this job twice in my career so far, and it has been the coolest job I've ever done. I often joke, and a lot of Marriott GMs will tell you this, I often joke that when I, when I finish with my stint at corporate, I'd like to go back and do a GM's gig. And hopefully by then, I would have convinced the powers to be to give me a brand of my choice and a location that is desirable, as Aditya said. Not the best, but desirable. As general managers, I truly believe that you have the opportunity to leave behind a legacy. Something that will be remembered and hopefully will be proclaimed. But you also have to face the fact that you are judged day in and day out every single day of your jobs. Because the performance and the reputation of your hotel is a direct reflection of you a direct reflection of you. And you have to live with that, and you have to deal with it. It's a reflection of you, your leadership style, and your teams. And when Manav asked me to talk here today, I thought long and hard about what I would say to you, but I decided I would share with you a personal story, something that happened to me several years ago, uh, an experience that made me change and reflect upon my own leadership and the way I managed a team. So I hope you like it. This clicker doesn't seem to be doing the job. Okay, so this story dates back to when I was general manager of a Marriott Hotel in Shanghai. That year, the 14 general managers, we had 14 hotels of Marriott in the city at that time, decided that we would participate in a dragon boat race, a rowing competition as part of the Dragon Boat Festival in the city of Shanghai. That's me on row four, sporting a blue baseball cap and if you look closely enough, you'll see the Arsenal logo, a football club that I support dearly, up on it. Why were we doing this? Because we wanted to raise money for charity. And we wanted to do this by doing something that was locally and culturally relevant. This was meant to be a whole lot of fun, but little did we realize what we were getting ourselves into. 18 weeks prior to race day, 18 weeks prior to race day, on a Sunday, we gathered on the banks of this lake called Changfeng Park. There is a, a huge park in Shanghai called Changfeng Park, and it houses a massive lake in the center of this park. And we gathered here, and this was meant to be the day that we were to meet with our coach. Yes, we had hired a coach. Coach Tan, as we called him, was well into his 70s. He spoke, he spoke a spattering of English, a couple of words of English, but he communicated through his gestures. He was, he was really wild in the way he communicated, and he was extremely passionate, and he had done this many times over. So he gave us the usual cursory look, made us do a couple of stretches. It's about 7 in the morning, and he said to us, sit down in this big circle around me. So we all got together and sat down in the big circle around coach. And he said something to the effect of, what are you folks hoping to achieve from this activity? The answer was simple, right? We wanted to win the championship, we said. After all, you put 15 GMs in a boat, anything is possible, right? Never mind the fact that we, had, we were from eight different countries. And never mind the fact that we had never worked together on anything on our lives before, except, of course, customer engagement evenings. You know the ones I'm talking about? Fueled by wine and cocktails and canopies. And never mind the fact that many of us had never picked up an oar 
in our lives before. We never had. Three of us out of the 15, including me, couldn't swim more than 10 meters to save our lives. But we decided that we wanted to win the championship. So he looked at us, he smiled, and he said, folks, you've got 18 weeks to go. Only 18 weeks to go. The championship involves a number of elimination rounds. How about we try and win the first race and then see how we go from there? We said, fine, sounds good. He went on to explain that there would be 12 people on the boat at any given time. 12 people. 10 would row, two rows of five each, and one person would stand out of the back and manage the rudder. I'll show you a picture of that. That's the person at the back managing the rudder. The captain of the ship, he said, sorry, this isn't, the captain of the ship, he said, would sit out in the front and dictate the pace at which we rode based on the beat of a drum. And that's how it worked, right? The captain would be the only one to speak on that boat during the race. And the captain would be the only one to communicate with the person on the rudder. Nobody else would talk. The rest of you would put your heads down and row. Choose your captain wisely, he said. The captain sets the strategy. The captain decides the pace at which you row based on how you're performing in relation to the competition and the distance to the finish line. I've seen the captain make all the difference between winning and losing, he said. So we chose our captain wisely, put on our life jackets, and got into the water for the very first time. Three minutes later, that's what happened. <laughs> and that continued to happen for the next five to six sessions. I remember we did five or six sessions that day, and they all pretty much ended up like this. That's the day I developed a healthy respect for the person that invented the life jacket. Seriously. So coach and captain got us around in the circle again, the famous circle. And they said, guys, this is not happening. Are we doing this or are we not? It was a simple conversation. If you're not going to do this, then let's pack up and walk. It's a perfectly fine Sunday afternoon. Let's go out and have some beers and forget that we ever tried to do this. But if you're going to do this, let's show some grit, let's show some determination. Tough conversation, but we decided to stick together and see this out. For many of us on that team, this was our chance to do something that we had never done before. And I know that when we left the training session that day, we were now a team committed to getting this right. And we wanted to win collectively, but we also wanted to win as individuals. It was important to us that we won. So we practiced hard. Once a week for the next six weeks, we moved different people on the boat, got the combination, the balance right. We thought we got the right people in the right positions. But we were still well off the pace. Coach got us together again. And we learned that day that it was not about brute power it was about stamina, it was about concentration, it was about discipline, but most importantly, this was about balance and rhythm. Keep your heads down, he said, and listen for the beat of the drum. Row in sync. And remember one simple rule, he said, one boat, one beat. So we continue to practice. Twice a week now for the next 10 weeks. Hard work, but we were doing it. And gradually, our timing began to improve. We began to feel that maybe we had a shot at this thing. It started to build belief. It started to build confidence. And then two weeks before the start of the race came news that a competitor hotel company was fielding a team in the exact same competition that we were in. That's when it became deadly serious because now it wasn't about winning the race. It was about finishing ahead of them. Right. Who says we are competitive, right? So we practiced even harder. We couldn't do more than twice a week because it sort of wears you out. We practiced even harder. I will never forget the actual race day. It's a memory 
it is it is it has been etched in my memory and i say this because believe it or not ladies and gentlemen we won the first two races that we competed in and completely spent devoid of any energy and running on pure fumes we were badly eliminated in the third race we narrowly missed out on qualifying for the elimination phase of the competition but to ourselves we were winners we were winners because we had far surpassed what we set out to achieve and i'm not talking about the funds that we were meant to collect we 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 smashed all records when it came to collecting funds but we were winners because we had collectively done something together that many of us had never done before and that other hotel team we beat them in race 2 beat them by four boat lengths those who are not who we shall not name and shame here today i tell you the story because it has left many learnings for me as a leader this thing happened over 18 weeks as you know and there's a lot i took away from this race as a leader it made me reflect upon the way i manage a team and how i lead a team and there's a couple of things i want to share with you through the story here today and the first is as general managers as captains of your ship please do things differently challenge the status quo and i'm not saying disrupt the status quo because a lot of you here work with different brands you have brand standards and you have a thousand things that you need to adhere so i'm not necessarily saying you need to go out and disrupt the status quo i'm saying learn to challenge it if you want to have something that you don't have you have to be willing to do something that you have never done so be a great listener be a great risk taker and take the occasional gamble calculated risk be willing to challenge your own assumptions there were many different ways we could have raised charity that year and i can think of three easy ones a simple email request to a lot of people and we could have probably raised the funds that we were looking to raise two we could have done the annual fundraiser that we all do would have been another easy way to raise charity or three we could have maybe put drop boxes in various play, various spots in the hotel pretty easy to do but we chose to do something different that was a spectacular success for many of us that day and as a general manager again as a captain of your ship if you want to achieve dramatically improved results which all of you want to you have to be prepared to take courageous transformative decisions and back yourself and your team to see them through don't give up halfway after you make those decisions make those courageous transformative decisions as leaders of your business the other thing we learned that i wanted to share with you is don't be afraid to seek professional advice it is not a sign of weakness it is a sign of maturity in my opinion remember the dragon boat if not for coach tan there was no way we could have achieved what we achieved he was the key to our success learning from the successes and the failures of another individual is priceless and i say this to many of my gms and i'll share this with you you don't know what you don't know and you can always talk to yourself probably over a drink but sometimes you have to seek expert advice and there's no shame in doing it one of the first pieces of advice i give people who are looking to grow their careers is get a coach whether it's a professional coach or a life coach the second piece you have to understand is as leaders of your business you need to continually further your learning our world is changing rapidly today and if you want to continue to prosper and thrive and do the amazing job that you folks are doing today you need to academically upskill yourself you cannot be left behind in the in the bubble of experience in the bubble of i'm too busy in the bubble of i've got so much on my plate that is your responsibility create a robust development plan and stick with it and no matter how busy you are no matter how many things you have to do stick with your development plan it is yours it is truly personal and is something that will take you a long way in your career the ability to acknowledge this and act on it is a sign of a mature leader and as a general manager if you do it for yourself 
you're probably going to do a lot of this for your team. Bring, coming on to team, I, there was a lot of talk today about, about teams. And I'll tell you this. We all know that a leader is as good as their team, but do we focus on our teams enough? Do we really? I see a number of my own hotel GMs focus so much on external factors today, external factors, factors that they have no control over, that they forget to focus on the core strength that they have, which is their people. The one thing that they should be focusing on, they don't because they're so distracted, focusing on everything else that is going on externally. Many things of which they have no control over, right? And I urge you today, focus on your people. And what I mean by that is train them, educate them, motivate them, engage with them, and develop them. Do that and they'll work miracles for you. Half your job will be done, more than half of it. So please focus on your people. It is, it is, it is important to, to that you, that you, that you do that. If you, if you remember the dragon board again, coach and captain. Captain sat out the front of the boat watching the team, keeping a close eye on how the team was doing. Watching to see if everybody was doing their job, completely focused on the team, not focused on the competition. Information of the competition comes from the person managing the rudder. The captain doesn't worry about that information right now. So focus on your team, figure out how people are doing, smile, ask them questions about their family, build that culture that is important to be a winning team. And finally, practice. Many of our, my GMs have heard me say this, you only get one shot at doing most of what we do. You only get one shot at a wedding, right? Hopefully. Um, you get one shot at it. And in our industry, Practice and preparation is everything. And I, and I see many a time we don't apply the requisite discipline that is required for this. We show up for a two-hour meeting with a 20-minute preparation. Good luck with that, right? Happens time and time again because we are busy. But practice is simple. The more you do of something, it's a simple logic, the more you do of something, the better you're probably going to get at it. It's a pretty simple logic, right? And practice builds confidence and builds self-belief. It shows that you're a serious professional who is truly concerned and passionate about the business. Mahatma Gandhi used to say, an ounce of practice is worth tons of preaching. And I'm also going to talk about celebrating milestones. Every time we bettered our timing on that boat, Coach couldn't speak English, but he would go wild. He would be maniacal. He would make all these expressions that, that imprinted the pride he felt onto us. As a leader, set your milestones, but please don't forget to celebrate them. Don't forget to celebrate what your team has achieved. It means a lot more to them than you will ever know. And the final thing I want to tell you is this. We talk a lot about making a difference, and I'm going to say to you, try and make that difference. There's a big difference between making it and trying to make it, right? I know it comes real low in our priorities today when we run our businesses, but as leaders of the business, you have the responsibility to give back. And how do you do that? You do that by creating an atmosphere in your hotels that allows people to connect with giving back to society. Little ways, big ways, but leave it to the team to do that. As GMs, connect with the local community where you operate your hotel in. It gives your job and people's jobs a much deeper meaning. We are a social species after all, and we all like to connect and feel a part of something. So folks, I'm going to leave you with this, but the last thing I'm going to say, when you go back to your hotels, you're going to take a lot of great stuff from today's conference, but if there's one thing that I want you to take away, it's this. One boat, one beach. Thank you very much. Sir, this might be a little off topic, um, and uh, since we all know the importance of the human element in our industry, and also about uh, the increase in the application of technology in our industry, so how could this human element be integrated with technology to create uh, intangible experiences for our guests? 
at hotels. Okay, so if I got that right, you're asking me, how do we keep hospitality alive yes. while bringing in all the tech that we talk about, right? Okay, so it's pretty simple. I think, I think the way we see it at Marriott at least, and I'm sure most of my illustrious colleagues in other companies will see the same way, technology has to be the enabler. It can't be the end of end all. People don't come to a hotel to experience great technology. They come to a hotel to experience a great stay, but we hope as hoteliers that we're able to use technology to enable a better experience. So it can't be all pervasive, it can't be all consuming, it has to be a key component uh, of the stay, both front end and back end component of the stay. It allows us to customize experiences and also allows us to wow the customer with a lot of cool stuff. So I'll give you two interesting stats that we, we have at Marriott. One is, until about five years ago, the first thing that a person would do when they checked into a Marriott hotel was, was what? They would use the bathroom. True. Most people, the first thing they did five years ago when they checked into a hotel room was use the bathroom. Today, what is the first thing they do? They log on to the internet, right? So as hoteliers, we don't need to redefine the internet. We need to make sure it's easy to access and it works. And I'll give you a simple example of that. I don't want to go through five pages before I get internet. I want to be able to walk into a hotel. I want, the, I want to be recognized. I want the system to talk to my device and I want to be on. It's like turning on the tap. So we've got to make it easier to use uh, in that. The other stat I want to share with you is about televisions. We, we constantly talk about getting bigger and bigger and bigger and flatter televisions in our rooms today, right? We all, we all do that. Do you know that more people today watch content on their own devices and not on the television? I mean, I was in my room at the Aloft uh, Aerocity last night. That's where I stayed. And I didn't jump into bed and plug my laptop into the TV and do my emails on the TV, which is what all cool people like to tell us we do. I, I sat on the bed and did my emails. I didn't watch TV at all yesterday. So I think technology has to be an enabler. It has to be scalable. That means everyone's got to have it. You can't go to one hotel and not have it in the other hotel because then that dilutes the promise. Third, it's got to be cost effective because it, it's amazing the speed with which it flies out of fashion is amazing these days and we get owners to invest all this money and then it goes, it goes to waste. And the last thing I'm going to say is people have got to be given a choice of whether they want to use it or not. And I'll give you an example. I checked into, we had our GMs, our, our Asia Pacific General Managers Conference in Shanghai in March. It was at the W Hotel in Shanghai. And they had a booth where you could check in using facial recognition. Sounded cool, right? A lot of people lined up to do it. I didn't. So I think people have got to be given the choice of whether they want to use it or not. So that's where I think tech needs to come in. Into our, into our thing. It can't be all pervasive, but it's got to be an enabler. That's what I'd call it. Thank you, sir. Any follow-up questions? I think we're good. All Thank right. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.